Well, good evening and welcome to 412 Church. You guys having a good day? Everyone get some laughs in now? Better now than never, right? Uh, I'm Pastor Roy. I get to hang out with you awesome people on Wednesday nights. You guys truly make it a blessing. I just like to have fun. As you learn, we get serious too. So welcome. It'll be a great time as we've been going through our series of seeing Jesus in the Psalms. Uh, it's been a fantastic time. We so far have looked at Psalms 110, Psalms 23, Psalms 10. No, I forgot all the ones. One. One too many zeros off of the other one. All right, <laughs> Psalms 110, Psalms 1, Psalms 23, and tonight we're going to be in Psalms 98. So with that, let's pray and we'll get into God's Word. Uh, dear Heavenly Father, truly we are grateful for the fact and opportunity to come together. We're grateful for your Word and just the way that it challenges us, but it encourages us to grow and to develop that relationship with you, Lord. So Lord, we lift up our time together. We pray um, that we can leave the distractions of this world behind us, that we can look forward to the things that you would have for us. And truly, as we dig into your word, Lord, we can uh, learn more about you, but truly we can develop that deeper relationship with you, Lord. So we thank you for the time. I pray that I would rightly divide your word and we would just have a blessed time. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. I got a question for you tonight. Have you ever planned something with the intent for it to be remembered as truly a great ordeal? Everybody? Okay. Now we all know when we plan things to be big and to be great, there's always that risk that what will happen? The inevitable, right? Murphy's Law. So in the planning of that event that you could think of right now, did it go as the way you planned it or the way that you didn't foresee coming? It happens so often that we put so much effort in, and I'm sure many of us can remember that event that we planned perfectly down to the T, but yet at the end of the day, no one really remembered all the details of the event. They remember the mistakes that were made. They remember the way that you embarrassed yourself. And it will ever live down as the worst thing in history. I kind of liken it to the idea where there's that picture all of a sudden that pops up and goes, yep, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got into this situation right now. And then the story unfolds, right? I was trying to think of an embarrassing story for myself. And unfortunately, I've blocked every single one of them out of my memory. <laughs> That's just what I do. I remember everybody else's misery and pain, unfortunately. Um, but I, I was thinking of this, and there was a time uh, a friend of mine wanted to throw a party for another friend of ours. So my friend Ryan wanted to throw a party for my friend Don. Don was going into the mission field, so we thought, hey, this will be great. We don't know when we're going to see him again. Uh, we spent like four years in college. This is a couple years after that, hanging out, doing stuff. So he has this party, and his whole intent is to, you know, do all the nice things we're supposed to do, Right be there, share some funny stories, support, pray for him, and then like not see him again, right? That's what you do. Well, Ryan thought, you know what would be great is if we could roast Don. And we're like, okay, if that's what you want to do, we're down, you know? It's not hard to come up with embarrassing stories to tell about somebody, and some of us are really good at it. So Ryan had an event that happened in college because he was his roommate his freshman year and then it led into a sophomore year where um, basically he decided to, in a sense, set up a whole fake person on, um, at that point in time, it'd be like instant messenger. This is like the late 90s. And kind of develop a girl basically for a relationship, right? So this is catfishing before catfishing was a thing. So he does all this work. It goes great. So that's the story that he shares. Well, as the night goes on, all the stories turn from Dawn to Ryan, Unfortunately, when we still talk about this night, it's all about Ryan and how we embarrassed him because Ryan was just an easy person to embarrass. Ryan's plans for the night did not go the way that he planned for them to go. Often, things in our life work out the same way where the plans that we make aren't always the way that the things come out in the end. With that being said, Isaac Watts is a well-known hymn composer. He's written many hymns that have shown up in hymnals across denominations of, of the United States. Um, he's wrote timeless classics such as Alas and Did My Savior Bleed and Oh God Help in the Ages of Past. Or you might know this one, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. All those psalms that he's, or songs and many more that he has written were all based upon psalms. Psalms that he read, psalms that he, he took the, the pieces of it, the verses and parts, and made them into songs. His best and well-known hymn, though, he did not intend for it to go the way that it went. When he penned the poem that wrote it out from Psalm 98, 
his vision was way different than the way that it came. The hymn that came from that was Joy to the World, sung by millions of Christians during Christmas and even others in that season. Watts used the scriptures as inspiration for his hymn, uh, paraphrasing passages from Psalms 98 and saying um, things in the psalm, basically saying, I just drew a blank of what he said, but (laughs) he paraphrased pieces of the Psalms and drew that the imagery and joy of Christ's first coming and Christ's second coming, emphasizing more on Christ's second coming. But the way the hymn played out, it became a Christmas hymn. It didn't go the way that he intended. And though it wasn't what he expected or what he planned for, God used in other ways. Oftentimes, we have to be careful with the way that we look at things, and we've been talking about that so far as we've been looking at these psalms, that they may read one way, or we may have one perception of one way, but what's there is truly something much deeper, but we have to take the time to dig into it. And Psalms 98 is really, as we're going to see, is about Christ's first coming, but it's more about Christ's second coming and the joy that we have in Jesus as our Savior. So as we look at Psalms 98, the title of the message is, our Savior Jesus. We're going to read the psalm in its whole. It's only six verses. I picked some big ones so far, I know. It's going to read it in its whole, and then we're going to, or nine verses, my bad, not six, nine. I'm dyslexic, so I flipped it and turned it upside down. It's got nine verses. We're going to read, picking up in Psalms 98, verse one. It says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. For he has done marvelous things. His right hand and his holy arm have gained him the victory. The Lord has made known his salvation. His righteousness was revealed in the sight of the nations. He has remembered his mercies and his faithfulness to the house of Israel. All the ends of the earth have seen the salvation of our God. Then it says in verse 4, Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in song, rejoicing and singing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp. With the harp, the sound of the psalm. With trumpets, the sound of the horn. Shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth. With righteousness, he shall judge the world and the people with fairness. Psalms 98. So as we're going to break it down tonight, we're going to break it into two parts. The first part that we're going to see is singing praises of the first coming. Verse 1 opens with the line, Oh, sing praises to the Lord, a new song. And I don't know if you're like me, but sometimes that begs the question, if this is a new song, what was the old song? Do I know the old song? Did I miss something in the mix? Right? Well, we know the book of Psalms. All of them are what? Psalms. And they're songs. One of the other interesting facts about Psalm 98 is it's titled specifically a psalm. It's the only one that's titled a psalm. So this is a song in itself, and this is a new song. The prior two chapters, if we were to glance back and look at the songs that were being sung in them, in in chapter 96, we see that we are encouraged to sing and praise God for his coming judgment. And then the next Psalm 97, we see that we're encouraged um, to sing of his sovereignty of what the Lord has for us. And then we come to Psalm 98, and it says, sing a new song. This idea of a new song, this is nothing new in the scriptures. If we look through it and we can see, we can take a glance back and survey the Bible, and there's many songs that we can see in the scriptures. Uh, One of the big ones we can look at, if we go to the Old Testament, after the Exodus and they cross the Red Sea, there's Miriam's song. And Miriam sings a new song when they cross the sea and they get to their side, because Why? They have the victory they have over Egypt and the, what God had done. And honestly, nothing like that had happened before. Anytime in history where the Israelites enslaved, 10 plagues set free, and then part of sea, cross a parted sea and their enemies swallowed up? No. So we got a new song, right? As we go forward, we can come to Deborah. And Deborah sings a different song. She doesn't sing the song of Miriam. She sings what? A new song. We can come forward into the New Testament, and then there's Mary's song. And Mary's song wasn't like Miriam's song or like Deborah's song. No, Miriam's song was about the Christ. And it was a new song. 
we can see the idea of a new song is not a new concept as we come to Scripture. It's truly one that is a concept that is played out time and time again. We could be encouraged when we read verses like Psalms 33.3 that says, Sing to him a new song. Or Psalms 40 verse 3, He has put a new song in my mouth. Or Psalms 96.1 even that says, Oh, sing to the Lord a new song. Sing to the Lord all the earth. Or then there's Psalms 144 verse 9 that says, I will sing a new song to you, O God. And of course, Psalms 149 1 that says, Praise the Lord, sing to the Lord a new song. And of course, we have Isaiah 42 verse 10 that says, Sing to the Lord a new song. And then if we jump all the way to the end in Revelation chapter 5 verse 9, it says, And they sang a new song. Or in Revelation chapter 14, verse 3, it says, They sang as it were a new song before the throne. The idea in each of these verses, and many more that we could find about a new song, is these new songs were sung on new occasions of triumph, new occasions of victory and God at work. So this theme that we have to look for in Psalms 98, the theme of the song that we are to sing is found here in the first verse. It continues, it says, For he has done marvelous things at his right hand. His holy arm has gained him victory. We see the songs that we're singing, and this song in particular is because of what God has done. His marvelous works, his marvelous things that he has done. We are singing the songs. And some people can say, hey, of course, we're singing about God delivering the people of Israel from different things. And we can say, hey, that's true. God did, right? This could be a new song about what God did for the people and bringing them out of the time of being exiled and under captivity in Babylon, right? That is something that they could be doing, right? Or it could be talking about returning and restoring the land of Israel to its right place. That could be great. And those are all marvelous things. But you know that there's one thing that's greater than all those things that God did for his people? In doing so was this. He sent a Savior for us. That is the most marvelous thing that God has done for us. And he delivered not just his people, but he delivered the whole world. What we see here is the victory that's greater than amongst anything and what God did in the person of the Son of God and the work of the cross. The theme of the song that we sing is one of salvation of the people. In light of Jesus' victory of the cross with his resurrection and the victory we can see of his over sin and judgment because of Jesus being our Savior. So, we see, for he has done marvelous things, his right hand and his holy arm. These are the means in which salvation is accomplished. And we see this as the prophet wrote in Isaiah 52, verse 10, when he said, The Lord has made bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nation, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. The holy arm who is as well as being the right hand, is the means, the person of salvation, which is Jesus Christ. Right now, Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father. And we know this is stated by Paul in Romans 8, 34. And this is the CSB version when he says, who is, he, who is the one who condemns? Jesus Christ is the one who died, but even more, he has been raised, he is all... He also is at the right hand of God and intercedes for us. Verses like Acts chapter 5 verse 31, Ephesians 1 verse 20, Hebrews 1 verse 3, and 1 Peter 3 22 all repeat the same thing, letting us know that Jesus has had victory over death and he sits now at the right hand of the Father. We can see the work of salvation through Jesus Christ and the cross. And we know as it continues in the passage that we read that it said there next, what the Lord has made known his salvation. We should be singing because of the work that God has done and did for us. In the New Testament, we read about the person and the work of Jesus Christ and the wor worldwide spread of what? The gospel, his story, God's love story to us, his redemptive story of wanting to save a people. And all this, he reminds us 
of what he's done, but he says, I haven't also forgotten. He says there, I will remember his mercy and great uh, faithfulness to the house of Israel. One of the marvelous things is his unending mercy and faithfulness to Israel. Israel really has never done anything to accept that, but God chose them amongst everyone else, and his faithfulness and mercy is poured out onto them continually. Which begs the question where people say, hey, the church has replaced Israel. This right here could kind of help them say, no, look at this. God doesn't forget his people. The church is a part, but it doesn't replace Israel. God is faithful in his mercy and faithfulness to them. But God doesn't stop there. It says in verse 3, all the ends of the earth shall, be, shall have seen the salvation of God. God's plan from the beginning is for all to come to Christ, for Jesus to save every Jew, and every Gentile. His plan is for everyone, not just the Israelites, the Jews, the group, but for all to come to him. What we've seen so far in the first few verses here of Psalms 98 is we have seen that Jesus came the first time. His work on the cross was for the salvation of all. We should be singing a new song in praise to him for the work that he has done we transition here from the first coming to the second coming. And we see truly that it's a little bit more that we should be doing. Let's read it real quick again. Verses 4 through 9. And verse 4, it says, Shout joyfully. A little bit different term right there, right? Shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Break forth in song. Rejoice and sing praises. Sing to the Lord with the harp. With the harp and the sound of the psalm. With trumpets and the sound of a horn, shout joyfully before the Lord, the King. And it says there, again in verse 7, Let the sea roar in all its fullness, the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands. Let the hills be joyful together before the Lord. For he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He shall judge the world and the peoples with fairness. So we see here in the second half, shout praises of the second coming. And in doing this, he doesn't set it up, the writer doesn't set it up the same way as the first. The first, he, he shows us the first coming. He shows us how we should be singing this new song and praising God for what he has done through his son, the Savior that he sent for us. But there's a change here in the terms and the way that it goes. And it's almost as if in the sense of if we read these verses here, we're getting a lesson on how to worship. And the way that he wants us to worship. He goes over kind of the hows, the whos, and the whys of worship. We'll look at it this way, starting first with this lesson of worship, a lesson, worship lesson with how to worship. Verse 4 begins the same way that verse 6 concludes, and it says, shout joyfully to the Lord or before the Lord. The picture of the passage is that we should be shouting or singing almost like this war cry. We should be shouting in triumph over our enemies and shouting in worship. Much as the psalmist said in Psalms 47 1 when it said, oh clap your hands all the peoples, shout to God with the voice of triumph. We should be singing or shouting in victory. And why? Because of the salvation that we've already read about in verse 3 that we've seen of the first coming now we're looking not just at the okay I might have broke something, who knows but our shouting or our proclaiming is to turn into song, as it says in verse, as the verse continues on. It says, break forth in song, rejoice, and sing praises. So it's not just the fact of a chanting that we should be giving off, but it should be more of a loud, boisterous song that we should be singing. And we should be enthusiastic and energe energetically praising our voices, and not just our voices alone as it tells us in how we should worship here. He says there should be some instruments that should be involved in what's going on. He mentions a harp and the sound of psalms and the trumpets and the horns. So looking at that, we look at the instruments that are listed there. A harp is a stringed instrument that would run about either between three to 12 strings on it. Depends on how talented you are to play, right? Like we have guitars with six strings and then we got guitars with what? 12 strings, right? Skill level is what I'm going with or sound, who knows. But if you notice the singing with the psalm, so it's supposed to be in tune with. So that means I'm out because I'm off key, but it's okay. So we got the, the harp. The next thing that he mentions there is a trumpet, which is a long cylinder metal 
tube type instrument that's going to give off a little bit different noise or sound to it um, and singing with it. Now, and then it says with a horn, either a ram's horn or a shafar, which is a longer type horn, which are going to give another kind of different sound to it, but it's going to be that charging sound. Because when you hear a horn, you just kind of want to go, right? Okay, I do. Maybe not you. It's all good. But all these instruments are to be paired with what? The voice. The voice of the people that are singing. So we have the voices, we have the instruments. Those are the things we're supposed to be singing joyfully and enthusiastically. All this is calling us to join in and sing praises to the coming king. So we see how to worship. The next we see is who is to worship. It said there, let the seas roar in its fullness, the the world and those who dwell in it. Let the rivers clap their hands and the hills be joyful together before the Lord. So we have the voices, we have the instruments, and now we're going to add in the sounds of earth to join in. We got the roaring sea. And if you heard the sea uh, crash on the shore before, just the sound that it makes, and it hits there and it gives that kind of deep, bassy kind of crash sound. The seas crashing in and roaring up. The rivers are making a joyful noise with the hills. All creation should be singing. And all creation doesn't mean just us as creation, but the earth as creation. Or as the psalmist said in Psalm 66, 4, All earth worships you and sings praises to you. They sing praises to your name. See, the rocks will cry out. The earth will sing of the Lord's goodness. We will sing of the Lord's goodness. The poetic imagery of praising from creation is wonderfully played out right here. But it's not enough. The praise should not also come from those, should also come from those who dwell in the earth, in this world. Which means we can't let the earth sing without us. We should be joining in on those praises. So we've seen the how to worship. We've seen who is to worship. And lastly here we see why we worship. And I don't know about you, but typically when you learn things, you always want to put the why first because it gets more buy-in, right? But we're putting it at the end just because I didn't want to mess up order and hear all the understanding. You did it wrong, Roy. I know. So we put it at the bottom because that's where it fits. But the why to worship And it says there in verse 9, For he is coming to judge the earth with righteousness. He shall judge the world and the people with fairness. While the Savior came to save, we can sing a victory that we have. We can also sing because it didn't end there. He made a promise that he will return and come again. Creation rejoices because God is coming to judge the earth. His judgment will be with righteousness and fairness He's, and here we see God's final return, his final resolution in these verses anticipates the onset of the messianic kingdom to come. And in doing so, beyond human celebration for the new song all this day, the earth will sing, its people will sing and praise when the Lord returns. And the end of the Psalms here, it comes to a close. And the psalmist paints a picture of nature rejoicing at the return of Christ, whose coming appearance will bring salvation, restore the earth, judge the world. And why does the world rejoice in this coming? Because the psalmist knows that those who submit willingly to God will have nothing to fear. And what is it going to look like? What is that picture of Christ's return? Well, over in Revelation chapter 19, Verses 11 through 16, John paints the picture for us. I will read it to you. He says this in Revelation 19, verse 11, starting, it says, Now I saw the heavens open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he judges and makes war. His eyes were like flames of fire, and his head on his head were many crowns. He had the name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the word of God. In verse 14, it says, The armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he would strike the nations, and he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the wine presses of the fierceness of the wrath of the Almighty God. And it says in verse 16, And he has on his robe and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. That is the image 
coming back of our Savior, Jesus, when he returns to earth. And what we see here is the writer of Psalms 98 gives us clear reason to celebrate in joy of the first coming, but to truly celebrate in the greater joy of Christ's return in the second coming. So what? We have all that. So what? What do we do? I have a little bit longer question for us than normal, but because of that, of what's playing out here, it simply says this. Is Jesus' second coming a joyful or fearful thing for you? For many people, this is a stressful question. If you were to ask them, how do they feel about Christ coming back again? It stresses them out because fear of the return of Jesus and why? Because they know that they're going to have to face Jesus. They're going to have to stand before him in judgment for their actions or their lack of actions in this life. They will stand before the Savior. But the thing we have to understand is, and we want to get this right, if we've already come in the first if we've already accepted the first salvation, the first coming, know this, when the rapture of the church happens, which I believe to be in the beginning of this whole layout, we will be raptured and taken up. We will watch the seven-year tribulation play out. He will return at the end of that. Those people that didn't accept Christ, they're the ones that are going to have to fear. They're the ones that are going to have to answer to. They're the ones that have to judge. We are the ones that are going to be sitting up there with our horses, watching the battle go down, and pretty much cheering on, and praising in victory, of his coming. Jesus' purpose for his first coming was not to judge, but it was to save. And it was clearly stated in John three seventeen: for God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. The first coming brings so much joy, but when one does not have the joy of the first coming, they cannot have the joy of the second coming. When we understand the joy of the first coming of Jesus and that the joy is found in the salvation, it has nothing to do with us, but what God had done for us, the salvation plan that he put into place, and we accept that plan of salvation and understanding who what God did for us, not what we did for ourselves, or as Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, and this is the ESV version, he says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, that, and this is not your own doing, it is a gift of God, not as a result of works, so that anyone may boast. Well, we understand that first coming, that process of salvation that God sent the Savior for us, Jesus, and we accept that, we can look to the second coming with joy, not fear. And when we grasp this truth, truly, we can be at a place where we can be joyful, we can be excited, we can be shouting and singing his praises. Or as John wrote in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, and this is the CSB version, he says, Now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his second coming. Because Jesus came the first time and has promised to come a second time, we can sing with confidence, joy to the world, the Lord has come, let earth receive her king. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, truly we are grateful for your son who came the first time and is to come the second time. Right now I pray for my brothers and sisters in this room and myself. You know the ones that struggle, the ones that are at the fear point of the second coming. I pray that you would start this work in them to see the joy they can have because of the first coming of Jesus and the work that was done on the cross, Lord. I pray for the rest of us as we go about our business and our thing, that we would have the boldness to not simply just sing, but that we could shout the praises and encourage those to look forward to your second coming. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.